The plane is flying at 39,000 feet when the three young Ethiopians make their move. When I heard a noise at the back, pushing the air hostesses away. There was uh, some kind of noise in the cabin, and I heard the cockpit door slamming open, just bang. Perfect flying weather. Everything is following the familiar pattern. What was that? We have to get down! We've lost pressure. I saw a brilliant flash of light and boom. Everything was going, was being sucked out of the plane. Here's what's happened. An explosive decompression has torn away 375 square feet of the fuselage. We were in a tremendous blast of wind. The wind blast was unbelievable. A mass of things just went whoosh out the plane. You know, hair was up here. Everybody was in their seat, except the stewardesses. I saw the stewardess get smashed down in the, in the aisle. I could see her hair blowing, and I could see blood, but I, that's all I could see of her. Jean Sato-Tomita has been struck by debris at row two. Michelle Honda has been thrown to the floor at row 15. There's no sign at all of CB Lansing. I will take control column. I can't hear you. Only seconds have passed since the explosion. The wind noise makes it impossible for the flight crew to communicate. We lose back there? I can't hear you. We've lost pressure. Now, for the first time, they gain a sense of what's happened. Visible over a mound of tangled debris, there's blue sky where the airplane roof used to be. The first five rows are now completely exposed to the sky on both sides of the plane. The initial threat of being sucked out has passed since the airplane is now completely depressurized. But passengers are still in danger. My seatmate was flopping out outside the aircraft because at that point, it was just the floor and no walls or seating. And so I grabbed him. The cold and oxygen deprivation are both potentially deadly. Just imagine the scene up there. The top of the airplane broken off. The passengers don't have any ability to get supplemental oxygen because the critical tubing that feeds that oxygen is now gone. And at 24,000 feet, with very little to breathe up there, the passengers become incapacitated. That's called hypoxia. If you stay up at that altitude for any prolonged period of time, you become more and more physically disabled. With the top of the airplane gone, you now have 300 mile an hour winds blowing into that cabin. That's three times hurricane force winds. Those people were dressed for Hawaii in the springtime, not minus 50 degree temperatures. Any period of time at 24,000 feet, and those people will die. High above the Pacific Ocean, an extraordinary drama is unfolding. An explosion at 24,000 feet aboard a Boeing 737 bound for the Hawaiian island of Oahu tears 370 square feet of fuselage from the airplane. The Boeing 737 has become the best-selling commercial aircraft in aviation history. Over 10,000 737s have been sold. The accident airplane was number 152 off the production line, delivered in May 1969. The airplane was designed for a 20-year service life and 75,000 flights. This one had exceeded that number, though many were of short duration. Its fuselage was under constant stress because of pressurization. The fuselage of the airplane is actually breathing. It expands and contracts depending on altitude. When it's on the ground, it's in a contracted status. When it's at altitude, 24,000 feet, the fuselage expands, so the airplane is constantly cycling. That's pressurization. That will weaken the structure over a long period of time. And given the history of this airplane being a very high cycle airplane, that probably had something to do with weakening the structure of the fuselage. With thousands of 737s taking to the skies every day, investigators need to be certain what made this one burst apart. In Washington, D.C., Jim Wildey is one of the NTSB team who worked the case. His expertise as a metallurgist proves crucial. I got a call about 2 in the morning, middle of the night, from my boss, 
and there had been an accident in Hawaii. They were putting the team together. Uh, I hopped on a plane and, and went to Hawaii. He takes samples from the remaining fuselage and back in the lab discovers something barely visible to the naked eye. Hairline cracks like this between the holes where rivets had been. On the Aloha airplane, there's telltale discoloration inside the overlapping joints. Here is the vital clue. You can see now where the dark material is the epoxy that was used to bond the two layers of the lap joint together. The white material you see here is corrosion damage of the aluminum fuselage skin. So the original intent was the stress that's trying to pull one skin away from the other skin piece, the stresses would go through the bonding and not through the rivets. Of course, as this thing becomes disbonded, now the rivets themselves are loaded, and especially this top row of rivets, and this is the row of rivets we think that had the fatigue cracking in it that led to the eventual opening of the roof structure on the Aloha 737 airplane. The Hawaii climate with humid and salt-laden air helps corrosion to occur. But instead of grounding airplanes for a nose-to-tail examination, Aloha has inspectors make occasional checks, often at night, when those on duty are least alert. Working under artificial light, those tiny cracks escape detection. These cracks go unrepaired, and now you have an airplane that is a ticking time bomb. The witness saw cracking in this area, and we found fatigue cracking back in here. So this is the line where the fatigue cracking joined up. One piece came down this way and folded off, and the other piece went across the top and came off to the right side. The crew realizes they've been hit by a missile somewhere on the left wing. Their Airbus has become the first civilian aircraft casualty of the war. Jelly 2 one Hey, Gramps, did you guys say there's an aircraft on fire? This remarkable video was shot with the infrared heat-sensitive camera of a U.S. Apache attack right, helicopter. Could you confirm if there's smoke coming from the aircraft or fire or anything like that? Tower Dragon Team 54. You can still see smoke and flame coming from the left tip of the left wing. Okay, left wing tip uh, fire and smoke, huh? That's your problem. Thank you. With no hydraulic power, the crew has to crank open the landing gear doors and let the wheels drop down by gravity alone. Cautiously, they manage to coax a bit more speed from the engines. Let's land. Uh, tower, uh, Delta Lima Lima. Oscar, Oscar, Delta Lima Lima. Baghdad Tower, can you make approach now? Runway is clear for landing. They're swinging around to the right, trying to keep the plane steady and descend all at the same time, using nothing but the engines. Airport's at 340, come right. Now 320. Bumpy. As the plane approaches the runway, the nose is pointing dangerously low and the left wing is dropping. Come on, buddy. They are landing three, three left. Fire trucks on standby, medivac on standby. Steady. Steady. Oh, Come on, buddy. Back. Okay. Oh, not rain. Off the runway. Left 
the DHL Airbus has managed to land through an incredible feat of flying. Nice landing, wow. Confirm, eva evacuate. Evacuate. Evacuation. Both I handle. The DHL A300 is the first plane in Iraq to be hit by a surface-to-air missile. But in recent years, the threat of terrorist-controlled shoulder-launched anti-aircraft missiles has been growing. There had been roughly 30-odd incidents of uh, commercial aircraft being attacked by manned portable surface-to-air missiles leading up to the DHL one. What makes the risk of missile attack in Iraq so serious is that for months, nobody was guarding the abandoned weapons stores of the Iraqi army, leaving terrorists free to help themselves to millions of dollars worth of arms. There is widespread fear that these terror weapons could soon be targeting passenger airliners all over the world. The U.S. government's Department of Homeland Security is spending over $100 million on research to adapt military counter-missile technology for civilian airlines. It, it is inevitable today that commercial aircraft will have to be fitted at some time with laser and infrared jamming systems. If you look at things like the Queen's flight in the UK, the President's uh, aircraft in the USA, and the King of Jordan's fleet, they're all fitted. Terrorism is with us today and will always be with us for the rest of our lives. It's impossible to defeat terrorism, but what is possible is to control terrorism at a commercially acceptable level. If we don't do that, then there's no future for us. The crash of this jumbo jet would normally be a strictly Japanese affair, but it sets aviation alarm bells ringing around the world. Only weeks earlier, an Air India 747 had gone down in the Atlantic, killing 329 people. Now, another 520 are dead. Was there something wrong with the 747, the world's biggest jet? Could there be some unknown design fault? There were some 600 747s flying worldwide. A problem with the plane would have grave consequences for aviation. Ron Schleed, a top investigator with America's National Transportation Safety Board, the NTSB, was assigned the case. So it was very big concern on our part uh, about whether there was a problem with the 747, an airworthiness problem. And so we had to jump on this uh, very quickly to learn what happened. At the Washington headquarters of the NTSB, the chairman was extremely concerned at the potential consequences for world aviation. He wrote a personal note to his corresponding figure in Japan, asking him to invite the NTSB to join the investigation as guests. During the late 70s and 80s, Ron Schleed was involved with many international investigations for the NTSB. He's familiar with the sensitivities of working with foreign governments and heads to Tokyo, where he'll meet with the rest of his team. Representatives from Boeing, the plane's manufacturer, and an engineer from America's Federal Aviation Administration. When I arrived in Tokyo, the atmosphere in Japan was uh, extremely stressful. The news media, were everywhere, there was a tremendous amount of anger. Once in Japan, Schleed found that the local Japanese police had taken over the investigation and were treating it like a crime scene, diligently observing his team's every move. Everyone was, was considered suspicious. Japanese airline personnel, Boeing personnel, were considered suspicious. They weren't even allowed to go to the accident site. 
Schlied had to wait for two days before the Japanese authorities would allow him to visit the site. I was able to convince the Japanese to allow us to take Boeing people to the site with the stipulation that the Boeing people stick, stuck very close to us and uh, we supervised them while they were on scene. They could not operate on their own. Schlied found that to gain access to the site, the Japanese had quickly constructed helicopter landing pads. It was an amazing sight to look up at this mountain and see what looked like wreckage from an airplane at a distance, but you could not recognize any part of an airplane. As the plane climbs to 24,000 feet, the air outside gets thinner and thinner. But the air inside the cabin is pressurized for the passenger's comfort. The difference in air pressure between the cabin on one side of the bulkhead and the unpressurized tail on the other stretches the bulkhead and its faulty repair to the breaking point. In a test which duplicated these conditions, cracks begin to appear and lengthen around the rivet holes. Until the bulkhead snaps. In an instant, pressurized air from the cabin blows a 30 square foot hole, bringing down the ceiling around the rear toilets. The highly pressurized air blasts its way into the tail fin of the aircraft and simply breaks it off. From that moment on, the plane is doomed. The pilots don't know that most of the tail of their aircraft is missing, blown off into the sea below, along with the crucial hydraulic lines that allow them to control the plane. It all finally makes sense. Without the stabilizing influence of the tail and with the loss of ability to control the rudder and flaps, the pilots cannot control the plane. The giant aircraft now oscillates in a terrifying motion called the Fugoid cycle. Don't lower the nose. As the nose drops into a shallow dive, the plane gathers speed, which generates lift. The nose rises again, and the plane begins to climb until it loses speed, tips over, and begins to fall again. The whole cycle repeats itself over and over again. Flight 123 is now plunging up and down in terrifying dives, sometimes several hundred feet at a time. It really could be considered a miracle that the pilots were able to keep the airplane flying for 30 minutes or more after having lost all the hydraulics and their flight controls. But it kept circling and eventually worked its way into the mountains, and it became impossible for them to uh, to land. There was no real alternative for them at all, uh, except to fly as long as they could and hope for some miracle, which never occurred. Lower the nose. Lower the nose. Yes. Both hands. How about gear down? Gear down. So put the gear down. To understand what the pilots were up against, four hand-picked flight crews were placed in a simulator and confronted with the same situation. Not one of them could land the plane. The pilots of Flight 123 managed to keep their plane in the air for 30 minutes, much of it among high mountains. An amazing feat of flying. Back in Tokyo, as the cause of the JAL accident was identified, Ron Schlied had to break the news to his colleague from Boeing, one of the top designers of the 747. The simple truth was that a single row of rivets had been used for the repair when a double row was required. And when we uh, described our findings to him, you can imagine this Boeing man became very, very upset. Uh, uh, personally, uh, was crying because of the fact that his airplane that he designed and then the people that did the repair, because it was Boeing people that designed and did the repair, had made an improper repair that caused the airplane to crash. Boeing's reputation was damaged. But if they could derive any comfort at all from this tragedy, it was that there was no inherent fault in the 747. The plane went on to become one of the most successful civil aircraft of all time. FedEx Flight 705 is several minutes outside of Memphis, still climbing and passing through 19,000 feet. Jim Tucker is hand flying the airplane, using control wheel steering mode and enjoying the clear afternoon skies. 
A couple of feet away sits Auburn Calloway. Behind him lie frustrated expectations of a brilliant career and a marriage that ended badly. Out of the crew's sight, he prepares his weapons. The crew is in shock and confused. Get him! Get him! Calloway hurriedly retreats out of the cockpit. Unaware of each other's injuries, the crew starts to mobilize. Calloway has a backup plan. The spear gun stashed outside the cockpit is a deadly weapon. Sit down! Sit down! Get back to your seats! This is a real gun, and I'll kill you! Tucker does something that Calloway is not expecting. He pulls back the yoke and puts the plane into a sudden 15-degree climb. It throws the struggling men out of the cockpit into the galley behind. Get him! Three and a half minutes after the attack, Auburn Calloway is pinned and injured, but still won't relinquish the spear. The anger was coming in then, and so when I hit him, it was with the intent to disable him and eliminate his ability to fight. Sanders has disarmed Calloway and handed the spear to Tucker. You move, I'll kill you. You keep him contained, I'm going to get the airplane. Go get the airplane. I'm going. They decide that Sanders, the captain, Here. should fly the plane back to Memphis. Memphis, can you hear me? Is this Express 705 Heavy? 705 Heavy, yes. Express 705 Heavy, Memphis. Roger, I do hear you. You understand we're declaring an emergency. We need security to meet the airplane. We'll stop on the runway if we can. In the galley, Auburn Calloway still hasn't given up the fight. Calloway drags himself towards the jump seats with Peterson and Tucker on top of him. Express 705 Heavy, verify the situation is still under control. Uh, yeah, we're uh, it's uh, sort of under control. Peterson manages for the first time in the fight to get hold of a hammer, but is extremely weak due to blood loss. You gotta hit him, Andy, you gotta hit him! The DC-10 is only feet above the runway, traveling at 200 miles an hour. Captain David Sanders has landed the plane with only 1,000 feet of runway to spare. The crew of Flight 705 is safely on the ground, but not out of danger. Sanders is the last member of the crew on board. Standing in the door of the airplane, I had a sense of euphoria I've never experienced before since. It was the sense of we had been there and, uh, and we came back and we won. The crew has weathered the attack of a coworker, but they're badly injured. Co-pilot Jim Tucker has bone chips driven into his brain. Flight engineer Andy Peterson's life is in danger from massive blood loss. Both are in critical condition. The wounded men are rushed to the regional medical center at Memphis. Restrained and under guard, Calloway is also taken to the same emergency facility. But the important question still remains. Why did Auburn Calloway attack the crew of Flight 705? The full story is beginning to unfold. Divorced in 1990, Auburn Calloway still tries to support his ex-wife and their two children and wants to secure their financial future. The evidence for a suicidal mission against FedEx grows as investigators search the aircraft and find a letter to Calloway's estranged wife. Dear Pat, I want you and the kids to know that I lived for you. I thought of your welfare every day. By April 7th, 1994, Calloway may be thinking his career is over. Life had been one disappointment after another. The failed marriage, 
the kids he can't afford to send to college, the brilliant pilot who ends up as an engineer on a cargo plane. And now, even that may be about to go. Calloway may be afraid he'll be fired. He comes up with a solution. Calloway cashes in all the funds he can lay his hands on and sends a total of $54,000 to his ex-wife. But his life insurance is worth about $2.5 million if he dies in a work-related accident. I would much rather go on a date, time, place, and a method of my own choosing. I resolved some time ago that the next time my security and future is threatened or seriously jeopardized, it's time, my time to go. January 6th, 1995, almost four weeks after the bombing of PAL 434, the Philippine police get a lucky break. In his Manila apartment, the PAL-434 bomber has enlisted the help of an accomplice to mass produce his new undetectable bomb. An attempt to burn off chemicals gets out of hand. Acrid smelling smoke spills out of the apartment. It attracts the attention of the doorman who comes to investigate. Hey, what's going on? Sorry, sorry. Uh, we, we're playing with some fireworks, but it's okay. We put them out and we have all the windows open inside and we keep the door closed. It will be fine, okay? Uh, you all open the door. If we open the door, the smoke comes in the hallway. We keep it closed to go out the window, okay? Come it's okay. It's okay. Until the smoke dissipates, the bombers decide to wait outside the apartment. The doorman isn't convinced by their playing with fireworks story, and he calls the fire department and the police. By the time the firemen come, the smoke is gone and they leave after a quick check. The bomber now realizes he has left a very sensitive item in the apartment, and he persuades his friend to retrieve his laptop. He was uh, too clever a guy to come back and uh, expose himself because all along he knew that uh, that would be too risky for him to go back and be caught. The bomber's fear of getting caught is justified. Once police inspector Ada Faraskal learns that they are from Pakistan, she insists on seeing their room for herself. The police in Manila are on high alert due to a planned visit by the Pope in a few days. What Inspector Fariscal finds confirms her worst fears about the intentions of the tenants. Hey, no. You! Stop! The shot distracts the apprentice, and he trips over a fallen palm tree. But the cop discovers he has no handcuffs. The doorman improvises with the drawstrings of his windbreaker. In the meantime, the bomber vanishes. One of the first senior officers to arrive at his apartment is Sonny Rezon. Incident at uh, Doña Josepa apartment uh, was the breakthrough in uh, opening our eyes that uh, the Al-Qaeda terrorist cell was already operating here in the Philippines. The Philippine National Police know they have stumbled onto something big, and they inform Interpol, Scotland Yard, and the FBI. We got to turn. We'll have to use differential power. Disengage auto throttle, pull back three and four. Captain Reyes increases thrust to the engines on the left-hand side of the plane and reduces power to the engines on the right. Very slowly, the aircraft starts to circle right. He then lowers his speed to make a similar radius turn. With guidance from air traffic control, Reyes hopes that the maneuver will eventually line up with a runway at Naha. 
So while we were descending on low speed, I tried to test the flight controls, and there, is, there are some little reactions. The elevator is beginning to respond. Dex. The elevator is a control that makes the plane ascend and descend. 250 knots, flaps one, on speed. In order to land safely, Reyes will need at least minimal control over the elevator and rudder. Flaps five. As PAL 434 nears Naha, he continues to reduce his airspeed. Flaps 10 set. Speed 225. Okay, she's turning. Sir, if we reduce our weight, we will be able to reduce our approach and landing speeds. Suggest we dump fuel. That's okay, Magaling. Reyes orders the systems engineer to dump 36 tons of fuel. Five minutes, 20,000 pounds. Less fuel means less strain on landing gear and brakes at touchdown. Check. I was terrified when I saw the smoke trail behind each wing. I thought something must be burning and there would be another explosion. As touchdown gets closer, Reyes worries that the bomb may have done more yet unknown damage to the aircraft. I'm not certain our landing gear will hold up. Strap yourself in. I'll breathe the purser. So he talked to the head of the cabin crew and he said, we're not sure if the gears will go down. And in case the gears collapse while landing, be ready to evacuate. It's either you, you make it or you die. That's because you cannot do anything anymore. Runway in sight. With only minimal control over the aircraft, Reyes faces the most challenging landing of his career. As PAL 434 starts its final approach, the 292 people on board are pinning their hopes of survival on the skill of the cockpit crew. I know all, everybody was scared. I, we, we are all scared, I know that. Gear down. The gears were supposed to come down a few seconds, but that was the longest second. <laughs> that uh, because we were waiting for the greens to come yeah. on. Take a long time. It know? took a long time. It was a long few seconds until yeah. it when it locked. Yeah. Three greens, sir. Okay. I'm disconnecting the autopilot and landing manually. Okay, Dex, monitor my descent rate, call altitude and speed. Flaps thirty. Okay, five hundred feet on course. Flaps 30 set. Help me with the elevator. When I say push, I want you to push. Okay, 200 slightly left. Correcting. Push. 100. <clears throat> 50. 30. Power off. Pull. <clears throat> Your last uh, command was pull. Yeah. My last <laughs> command was pull. <laughs> <laughs> in August 1988, a detailed inquiry into the shooting down of Iran Air 655 concludes that the captain and crew of the USS Vincennes acted properly in the face of what they believed was a threat to their ship. But investigative journalist Roger Charles is not convinced. You're looking at a guy who's on top of the world. He's the captain of the billion dollar Aegis uh, cruiser. And now he's sitting at a table facing a possible court martial and uh, you know, even prison time. He reads a copy of the Fogarty inquiry and wonders why it contains no map showing the Vincennes position. I knew the fact that there was no such chart in the Fogarty report again was a signal, and a curious signal to me. Why is it not there? Skipper, you better come down. Sounds like the Montgomery's got her nose in a beehive. I'll be right there. When Captain Rogers first hears that Iranian gunboats are harassing merchant shipping, the Vincennes is well south of the Montgomery and destined for port in Bahrain. Gulf Sierra, this is Vincennes. Request permission to support USS Montgomery against surface contacts, over. Rogers asks Captain Richard McKenna, his surface commander, for permission to turn north to support the Montgomery. But McKenna only authorizes him to send his helicopter to investigate. Roger that, Vince sends out. Vector in Ocean Lord. 
But Captain McKenna is later startled to discover that the Vincennes has turned around and has closed on the Montgomery's position. He orders him to leave the helicopter in place and turn back immediately. My own personal opinion is it really did feel that they were looking for action when they, when they went to see the, the Elmer Montgomery. Um, my, my own feeling is that the situation was not out of control. It was really my call. And yet, uh, even though they were assigned another station, they took it upon themselves to be there. I feel that maybe they were looking for trouble. Jesus! Trinity Lord, this is Ocean Lord 25. We are taking fire. But once the Iranian gunboats fired on the Vincennes helicopter, the situation changed. Close Ocean Lord's position at best speed. The rules of engagement now allow Captain Rogers to respond with force. He is now authorized to head off in hot pursuit of the gunboats. But where does that lead him? In 1990, Roger Charles obtains a copy of a restricted report on the destruction of Iran Air 655 by the International Civil Aviation Organization. It gives the Vincennes coordinates. When Charles plots them on a chart, he makes a startling discovery. At the time of the shootdown, the Vincennes is two and a half miles inside Iranian territorial waters. By chasing the gunboats back into Iranian territory, Rogers inadvertently places his ship directly in the flight path of Iran Air 655. If Rogers had not taken uh, the Vincennes up to uh, attack the gunboats, uh, there would have been no shootdown of IR 655. I mean, that's clear. Up on the bridge, the crew has confirmed the kill. We had him, God, it was a dead on. The plane they believed was attacking them has been destroyed. Captain William Rogers thinks he has saved his ship from destruction. Nothing could be further from the truth. He's destroyed an Iranian passenger jet flying in an international air corridor. The decisive factor in Captain Rogers' decision to fire are the reports he receives that the plane is descending towards him, apparently about to attack. Altitude declining. It's the crucial moment. The inquiry team presses tactical information coordinator Leach on his call. OK, were you reporting descending elevations over the net? Over the internal net? Yes, sir. So in other words, when you saw that track, that aircraft start descending, you were reporting that up to TAO, CO, Gulf Whiskey. Yes, sir. Like an aircraft's black box, the Vincennes computers have recorded all the data on the Combat Information Center's screens. Those records show that Iran Air 655 had never descended. Fogarty sends a medical team, including a psychiatrist, to the Vincennes. They report that a condition called scenario fulfillment could have played a part in the tragedy. Range 13 miles. Had those in command on that day checked their monitors, they would have seen that Flight 655 was not diving in a classic attack profile, but was continuing its steady climb. Yet no one thought to do so. Well, Scott, uh, we have this disparity between what the data indicates happened and what the people said they saw at their various altitudes. Any idea why? Well, sir, the disparity baffles me. I thought about this for many days now, and I came to the realization that this data to me doesn't mean anything because I reacted to people I had operated with who were reliable. And when they reported at short range, they had decreasing altitude, increasing speed. I had no reason to doubt them. I had to make a split second recommendation to the commanding officer, and I did. So Lieutenant Commander Lustig trusts his men's judgment and Captain Rogers trusts Lieutenant Commander Lustig's. My confidence in Lieutenant Commander Lustig confirmed to me that the aircraft was, in fact, a threat. At nine miles, I felt I could no longer delay defensive action. I granted fire and permission.
Take order, track 4131. The Vincennes sophisticated combat information system gives its crew accurate information, but their fear has created a threat where none exists. The discovery of oil here in the 1960s was a shot in the arm for the British economy. Brent crude, as the oil is known, is a light sweet crude, ideal for turning into gasoline, and its price is a benchmark in the international oil market. It helped turn Aberdeen, the Scottish port city closest to the oil rigs, into a boom town, the European oil capital. All the leading oil companies have offices here. The city is focused on getting the black gold ashore. Because the rigs are so far offshore and the weather so unpredictable, helicopters are the only way to reliably ferry workers back and forth. Hundreds of thousands of people make the trip every year. The Super Pumas are the workhorses of the North Sea oil industry. Used around the world by industry and military, they are durable, tough, and made to withstand the elements. There are more of these helicopters flying offshore here than anywhere else in the world. The North Sea has scores of oil fields. They are divided up between several countries, including England and Norway. The governments then sell the rights to drill to a variety of oil companies. Marathon operates three platforms in the so-called Bray field, Bray East, Bravo, and Alpha. North Sea oil platforms are like cities that never sleep. They stand on the seabed, held up by enormous legs of either metal or concrete. Out here, you're surrounded by the sea with nowhere to go. The weather is often horrible, and the work on a rig can be rough, dirty, and dangerous. It's difficult to find and retain the skilled workers needed to pull the oil from the sea, so the platforms are built to keep the workers happy. Movies, internet cafes, gym equipment, and great food are provided by management to ensure the men are entertained. During 12-hour shifts, workers handle heavy equipment and deal with great heights or great depths. But there are strict rules, too. To protect the safety of everyone on board, there's no drinking and smoking is severely restricted. The day after the crash, they find their account of what caused the accident under question. Lightning, notionally, I sh at least, should not affect a very powerful North Sea helicopter. This is the first time I can re recall a lightning strike having ended up with this kind of conclusion. The experts are skeptical of the pilot's story. No helicopter is known to have crashed into the North Sea because of lightning. Perhaps there had been some mechanical failure. There are even rumors of pilot error, of recklessly flying into storm clouds. The evidence to support their story was now beneath the waves with 5-6 Charlie. The Air Accident Investigation Branch, Britain's air crash detectives, begin searching for the truth. It may look like a rig, but the stay dive is actually a ship, mostly used for servicing oil platforms. A day after the accident, the state dive is brought in to find and raise the missing helicopter from the bottom of the North Sea. The investigation gets off to a good start. Within a day, the television cameras on board the state dive's two submersibles locate what's left of 5-6 Charlie on the seabed. But raising it is a different matter. They carry on working into the night. Soon, several pieces of 5-6 Charlie have been recovered, but still not the vital clue, the missing tail rotor. Ed Trimble was the AAIB's lead investigator. 
But the big problem was to recover the tail rotor assembly. Without that, the investigation was literally going nowhere. We knew that the tail rotor assembly uh, had been dangling over the side of the pylon as the helicopter had ditched and it had therefore detached at some point between the ditching and where we had caught up with the main wreckage. Keeping the stay dive going would be costly. Ed Trimble calls his boss. He was fairly skeptical of our chances. Uh, he asked what I thought our chances were of finding the uh, tail rotor, and I, being an eternal optimist, I said 80%. To which he replied, I think you'd be very lucky if you've got a 10% chance of recovering the tailboard assembly in the North Sea. Ed Trimble stays up all night, relentlessly monitoring the underwater cameras. I didn't want to be in a situation where uh, we would have missed any evidence of further wreckage, and in particular, uh, any um, parts of the tailboard assembly. Go get yourself a coffee, Eddie. By the time uh, 8 o'clock was looming, I decided to go down to the galley to uh, get a coffee. And I couldn't have been away any more than maximum seven to 10 minutes when I suddenly heard these tremendously excited shouts from uh, our team. Yes, you we found it. <laughs> As I walked in, I ran in there, and smack in the middle of the screen was the whole of the tail rotor assembly. And even at the first glance, I could see that one of the tail rotor blades showed clear evidence of a lightning strike. The crew was right. The submarine's cameras revealed telltale burn marks on the tail rotor blade. A close look at the wreckage on the deck reveals that two of the main rotor blades were also struck by lightning. It's just after 1 a.m. on October 31st, 1999. 217 people on board Egypt Air Flight 990 are waiting for takeoff. The flight's command pilot is Captain Ahmed El Abashi. Oh. He has been with Egypt Air for 36 years. Huh? <laughs> yes. The command first officer is 36-year-old Adel Anwar. He switched duty with another co-pilot so he could return home in time for his wedding. Soon be a married man. Congratulations, Adele. Thank you very much. The airline's chief pilot for the Boeing 767, Captain Hatem Rushdie. Kamal El Batuti used to be an Egyptian Air Force flight instructor. He is now one of the oldest first officers at Egypt Air. Just over 20 minutes after takeoff, El Batuti is about to leave his seat. Former National Transportation Safety Board investigator Greg Phillips became an expert on the events of this flight. The relief first officer who would have been expected to come to the cockpit somewhere during the later part of the flight, uh, halfway or wherever he was comfortable, wherever the normal change would have been, came into the cockpit about 20 minutes after takeoff. Hello, Jimmy. How are you? How are you, sir? Huh? What's new? I, uh, I slept, I swear. Just wait. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to sleep at all. I might come sit for two hours but and then... I, I, I slept. I, I slept. You mean you're not going to get up? You will get up. First Officer Anwar concedes and is ready to hand over to El Batuti. Normally, this is the most relaxed, easy part of a long flight for pilots and passengers alike. Excuse me, Jimmy, while I take a quick trip to the toilet. Go ahead, please. Before it gets crowded, while they're still eating, I'll be back to you. Egypt Air's Flight 990 appears to be cruising smoothly over the Atlantic. Speak of the devil, eh? But then, the plane dips, plunging down. The nose pitches down, creating zero G and weightlessness throughout the aircraft. I rely on God. Whatever the first officer is intending, he says nothing except this phrase again and again. Adele. Captain El Habashi fights the disorientation of zero gravity, desperately trying to return to the cockpit. Warning signals indicate the dive is exceeding the maximum speed allowed for the plane, taking them to 99% of the speed of sound. This far past the plane's design limits, the stresses on the airframe are pulling it apart. What's happening? I rely on 
Captain El Habashi pulls back hard on his control column. Then he tries to use the engines to power their way out of the dive by pushing forward on the throttles. But he gets nothing. What? You shut off the engines? God. Stressed beyond endurance, the left engine is ripped from the plane. Egypt Air 990, New York Center. Egypt Air 990, if you copy New York At 1.50 a.m., Flight 990 disappears from radar screens, crashing into the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, over 60 miles off the American coast. It's just after 1 a.m. on October 31st, 1999. 217 people on board Egypt Air Flight 990 are waiting for takeoff. At 20 past one in the morning, First Officer Adel Anwar is going through his takeoff clearance with air traffic control. Tonight, Captain Rauf Noor El Din and First Officer Gamal El Batuti are the relief crew. They will take over after the first three or four hours and fly the plane until shortly before Cairo. Gamal El Batuti used to be an Egyptian Air Force flight instructor. He is now one of the oldest first officers at Egypt Air. He is so much older than the other co-pilots that out of respect, they call him Captain. Hello, Jimmy. How are you? How are you, sir? Huh? What's new? I, uh, I slept, I swear. Just wait. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to sleep at all. I might come sit for two hours but and then... I, I, I slept. I, I slept. You mean you're not going to get up? Look, if you want to sit here, there's no problem. I'll go get something to eat and come back, all right? Fine, fine. Look here. And with that, El Batuti leaves to get his meal. Everything's under control. Okay, chief. Thanks a day. First Officer Anwar concedes and is ready to hand over to El Batuti. Normally, this is the most relaxed, easy part of a long flight for pilots and passengers alike. Excuse me, Jimmy, while I take a quick trip to the toilet. Go ahead, please. Before it gets crowded, while they're still eating, I'll be back to you. Egypt Air's Flight 990 appears to be cruising smoothly over the Atlantic. Speak of the devil, eh? But then, the plane dips, plunging down. The nose pitches down, creating zero G and weightlessness throughout the aircraft. I rely on God. Whatever the first officer is intending, he says nothing except this phrase again and again. Captain El Habashi fights the disorientation of zero gravity, desperately trying to return to the cockpit. Warning signals indicate the dive is exceeding the maximum speed allowed for the plane, taking them to 99% of the speed of sound. In seconds, the engines stop and the power goes off, plunging the aircraft into darkness. Here, the cockpit voice recorder and the flight data recorder stop. No one knows what happened in the plane during the next two minutes. Stressed beyond endurance, the left engine is ripped from the plane. Egypt Air 990, New York Center. Egypt Air 990, if you copy New York Center. At 1.50 a.m., Flight 990 disappears from radar screens crashing into the surface of the Atlantic Ocean, over 60 miles off the American coast. Coast Guard search and rescue get a call at 2.15 a.m. A plane has disappeared, and Coast Guard vessels are called to the scene. At the end of October, the waters of the North Atlantic are so cold that normally life expectancy is about five to six hours. At the crash site, only pieces are left. Within hours, authorities know there is little hope for survivors. 593, this is Novokuznetsk Area Control. Please come in. 
310 miles north of the Mongolian border, air traffic controllers in Novokuznetsk wait for Flight 593 to radio that it's left their control area. Area control, please come in. The recovery operation gets underway. The Russian government mobilizes 238 soldiers, police, investigators, and rescuers. Everyone in the aviation world wants to know how a brand new state-of-the-art Airbus could fall out of the sky without any warning. Does the A310 have problems no one knows about? They need to find out fast. Chief Accident Investigator Ivan Mashkivsky is in charge. The crash site itself offers few clues. The ones he does have are puzzling. Unbroken bottles of champagne, a flight attendant in an oxygen mask, and finally, the body of at least one child in the cockpit. The plane's digital flight data recorder indicates the engines were running when it hit the ground. He rules out engine failure. Mashkivsky needs the expertise of a man who knows the A310 well. Someone who can also recreate the fatal flight and find out exactly what went wrong. Vladimir Biryukov is an experienced test pilot and crash investigator at the Gromov Institute in Moscow. He's an expert on the A310 Airbus. Uh, yeah, come. I think you should come and listen to this. Each investigation begins with a complete analysis of the plane's cockpit voice recorder. This time, it reveals something disturbing. Now, come and sit in my seat. Would you like to? Come on. Daddy, can I turn to you? Yeah. Kudrinsky was in the pilot seat, wasn't he? Yeah, according to the diagram. Can I turn this a bit? Yeah, but if you turn it to the left, where will the plane go? Left. Right. Look up. No. Again. Can I turn this a bit? Yeah, but if you turn it to the left, where will the plane go? Ten years ago, left. it wasn't unusual uh, for people to be invited up to the cockpit. Of course, since 9-11, it's become a lot tighter, and uh, you will find cockpit doors are locked generally throughout the flight. Every country sets its own rules as to who has the authority or the access to the cockpit. Some, in some countries, it's up to the captain. So the captain can invite guests up to the cockpit. But to have them actually manipulating the controls of an airplane, regardless of whether they have people on it or not, the fact that this was allowed to occur is definitely an exception in the industry. Dad, can I go back to my seat? The two investigators are stunned by what they hear on the cockpit voice recorder. It's unbelievable. These two youngsters, the ones who we couldn't identify, they were not thrown into the cockpit by the crash. They were his kids. And they were flying the plane. Captain Kudrinsky's children are about to pay him a surprise visit in the cockpit. Flight 593 is now over 2,000 miles east of Moscow, near the middle of Siberia. It's Eldar's turn at the wheel. He's been waiting a long time for this moment. Eldar finds the control column quite stiff, but he can't make the plane turn because the autopilot is keeping it on course. Is the plane turning? Suddenly, the column turns easily. Great. His father switches the heading select knob back to its original setting, ending the turn and Eldar's illusion of flying the plane. Why is it turning? Is it turning by itself? Yes, it is. It's been just over three minutes since Eldar sat down in the pilot's seat. The plane is tilting sharply, a turn that's getting steeper every second. The plane appears to be turning by itself, but no one seems to know why. Kind of zone? We've gone into a zone, a holding pattern. Have we? Of course we have. 
An arc has replaced the straight direction line on the screen. The arc looks like a plane in a holding pattern around an airport. As they study the screen, the plane continues to turn. It's now banked at 45 degrees, which is steeper than what it was built for. Suddenly, the command bars disappear from the primary flight display. The crew no longer has any information about course or heading. The plane is flying at 370 miles an hour and banking hard. Like a quick turn in a sports car, the sudden movement of the aircraft begins to push everyone into their seats. Guys! <laughs> the A310's autopilot works to keep the plane aloft. Suddenly, the nose pitches up. The increased G-force makes it difficult for Peskarev to reach the controls. He does his best, but nothing happens. Peskarev's hard turn to the left has had no effect on the plane. Hold it. Hold the control column. Eldar is the only one with both hands fully on the controls. He can only follow the most basic orders. He can't get up because the speed of the turn is pushing him back in his seat. To the left. To the left. To the left. Now to the right. To the other way. I am trying to get left. OK, get out. Eldar has been in the pilot seat for just over four minutes. And now he can't leave. His body feels twice its normal weight. Get out. Get out. Kudrinsky can do nothing but struggle against the crippling G-forces. The aircraft is plunging towards the snowy earth, and there's nothing anyone can do. The first search party goes out to look for the Airbus in the frozen, rugged Siberian wilderness. They finally locate the remains of Flight 593 on a wooded hillside about 60 miles east of Novokuznetsk. It's soon clear there are no survivors among the 75 passengers and crew. This was a brand new aircraft fitted with the latest technology. What could have brought it down? Why was there no warning, not even a distress signal? Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961 is a routine trip from Addis Ababa to the Ivory Coast. The captain is Leo Labate. At 42, he's an extremely experienced tank, pilot. 7,300 kilograms. Center tank is zero. He has more than 11,000 hours of flying time to his credit. Kilograms. Total fuel is 14,500 kilograms. Check. The day was a bright day, clear skies. Everything was fine. As the plane climbs into the sky, three young Ethiopian men have settled into their seats. All are in their mid-twenties. The plane is bound for Nairobi, but it's not where these passengers are planning to go. We took off, everything was fine. The cabin crew called us, she asked if we want to have coffee or tea, whatever. Yeah, thank you. Coffee? Make it two. The plane is flying at 39,000 feet when the three young Ethiopians make their move. When I heard a noise at the back, pushing the air hostesses away. Ah! There was uh, some kind of noise in the cabin and I heard the cockpit door slamming open, just bang. Three men barge through the door and arm themselves with the cockpit's fire axe and fire extinguisher. Get out. Get out! There were three guys, they were shouting. They came straight to the co-pilot and they started hitting him. Get up! There's 11 of us. If you don't do what we say, we'll blow this plane out of the sky. I told them, okay, don't hurt him. I'll do whatever you want. The hijackers make a very unusual request. Fly to Australia. What? Fly us to Australia. 
We don't have enough fuel to get to Australia. It's too far. We can go to Nairobi or Zanzibar or Dar es Salaam and then refuel and then go to Australia. In fact, the jet took off with just three and a half hours worth of fuel. But the hijackers don't know that. They've been reading the in-flight magazine, which tells them the maximum flying time of a 767. 11 hours. It won't take more than 10 hours to get to Australia. We don't have 10 hours of fuel. It says 11 hours. We don't carry that much fuel. We only carry what we need. They thought I was bluffing. They were convinced that the airplane was able to fly to Australia. Abate is shocked. No one else in the plane knows what the hijackers are demanding. If he does what they say, his plane will crash in the ocean. If he doesn't, they say they'll blow it out of the sky. Ethiopian Airlines Flight 961. This $40 million aircraft has become a 100-ton glider. The plane is out of fuel. A crash landing in the sea is all but inevitable. The loss of engine power starts rippling through the plane. As well as driving the jet through the skies, the engines supply power to most of the electrical and hydraulic systems. Without the engines, the computer screens, automatic pilot, and many other functions of the plane stop working. Although the engines are now useless, a low-tech backup system allows the pilot to retain some control. The ram air turbine, or RAT, is the last line of defense when all the engines fail. A small trap door automatically opens, and the turbine, a small propeller, pops out. The rushing air turns the propeller like a windmill, generating just enough electrical power for basic flight instruments and controls, including airspeed. Since uh, it was power off, that means there was no electrical or hydraulic power. The controls were heavy. The turbine doesn't provide enough power for Abate to operate the flaps, which would help slow the plane down for landing. Wherever he lands, Captain Abate will have to do so at a dangerously high speed. Power of landing, power of ditching, nobody's trained in the world. Flying over the water, you need accurate instruments. I didn't have any of the instruments. Without engines, a large passenger jet can glide 11 and a half miles for every 3,300 feet of altitude it loses. At 21,000 feet, the Ethiopian Airlines plane can travel for nearly 75 miles before it hits the ground. It's an extremely dangerous situation few pilots in the world have ever faced. In 1983, another 767 pilot found himself in a similar predicament. Air Canada Flight 143 ran out of fuel and landed on an abandoned Air Force base, sustaining only minor damage. In the right circumstances, a safe landing without power is possible. Captain Abate hopes to land at the airport in the Comoros Islands, but struggling against the hijackers, on the final turn, he loses his bearings and can't locate the runway. I was within the vicinity of the airport, so I was keeping the airport in my sight all the time. Then through the struggle, I lost my position. I lost where I was. In the critical seconds it takes to find the airport again, he loses too much altitude and doesn't know if he can make it to a runway. A water landing is now his only option. Landing on the ocean is even more dangerous than bringing a plane down on the ground. Oh my God! Oh no! The ditching was very rough. The aircraft broke apart into three pieces. In the end, of the 175 people on board the plane, 50 survive. Without the actions of Abate, many more could have died. 